Geralt, good of you to come by. What can I do for you? Yearning to play a few rounds of Gwent. That ought to set me straight. Yeah! Hey! I'm coming to you from Vats Mode. This is Julian Watkins, and I am representing the gang in our clubhouse known as Half Glass Gaming. What's up, gang? Hey, I exist. Yeah. Hello. There it is. We're all here. You know us. I'm Julian. That's just Josh. We got the Reverend. We got Mandy and a microphone in the middle of all of us. So, um, what's up with the world? What's going on in the world, guys? November, man. I know, right? Movember. <laughs> <laughs> November was nuts this year. I, I tried to do uh, NaNoWriMo, which is a uh, national novel writing month. The the goal is you write 50,000 words. Which um, is November. In the month of November. Okay. I think NaNoWriMo tends to promote overwriting. But on the other hand, it also promotes the idea of, you know, just be writing. Like, mm-hmm. keep writing, force yourself to write, which is is you know a good practice so you started it i take it you didn't finish it what happened well i i wrote ten thousand words in like three days Mm -hmm. and then you know i got busy with with podcast stuff and you know black ops came out a few days later fallout came out and then a week later star wars battlefront came out Mm -hmm. and so it was just brute like how am i supposed to write when all these great games are out well and if you own an xbox one uh Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider also came out. So yeah, you're a big Black Ops bro, huh? Yeah, I am. I mean, I got out of games for a while. I played I played in the PS1 era. I was, you know, probably at my height of playing games all the freaking time. And I sort of fell out of it. I got involved in some other things. And the game that brought me back was Medal of Honor Allied Assault, hmm. which was a World War II first-person shooter game mm-hmm. in the Medal of Honor franchise, mm-hmm. which was actually created by Steven Spielberg. The franchise or the game? The franchise. Oh, really? Yeah, the first uh, the first Medal of Honor was a Steven Spielberg game. Well, holy shit. Um, and it was on the PS1, and it was great. Yeah, they and, were a great series. You know, I got really into to Allied Assault and, you know, started playing games again, And what ended up happening is the team that made Allied Assault formed Infinity Ward and Mm. created Call of Duty. Mm. And so, like, for me, Medal of Honor Allied Assault was the first Call of Duty game. Yeah. You know, Black Ops set things originally in the Cold War era. No, I'm sorry. How does that differentiate from the main Call of Duty? Call of Duty Black Ops? Is that what it is? Yeah. Call Call of Duty Black Ops. Mm Mm-hmm. I've been a Black Ops guy since Black Ops came out, and mm-hmm. I, I love it. And Black Ops 3 it just was great. Do you prefer Black Ops to the traditional Call of Duty? The first Black Ops is probably my favorite Call mm-hmm. of Duty still, mm-hmm. and probably always will be. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, uh, Fallout 4. Then, yeah, Fallout 4. It's It interrupted the traffic on Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Uh, that makes me so happy to see. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I, I don't know how valid that data is. Or they said like a 20% traffic decline. <laughs> yeah. And then they had numbers that were like, this percentage of sports games are players. And it's just like, where the hell do you find this data? <laughs> kind of creepy. It is kind of creepy. But no, so yeah, I, I picked up Fallout 4. Three-fourths of this podcast. Uh, <laughs> Heavily in favor of Fallout 4. Yes. I I, I've man. actually not really been able to get into the Fallout series, so I, I haven't picked up Fallout mm-hmm. 4, uh, which I really like Skyrim. Uh, I, I've literally got over 2,100 hours logged on Skyrim since I got it. It's an unhealthy amount of time. Yeah, right, that, that I've been playing Skyrim. Sure. Uh, and I like Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind. Uh, I own Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. Mandy got me New Vegas because she's very nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, I have tried, but they feel like first-person shooters in a way that Skyrim does not. I play Fallout in third-person exclusively. Well, and, and you can exclusively. play. Exclusively. Wow. You can play Fallout in third-person. And and I, you know, when I do play Fallout Skyrim 3, too? Skyrim and Morrowind, and I actually don't like Oblivion for the same reason I, I don't really like Fallout, uh, like, they feel like they're designed to be played first-person in a way that Skyrim just does not. Fallout has the VAT system, and I do rely very heavily on it mm-hmm. but even with the VAT system I feel like I'm picking options from a menu which okay like that's what it's there for but 
it doesn't appeal to me the same way plain third-person Skyrim does. Uh, VATS, for the people who haven't played Fallout 3 and 4, stands for vault Tech Assisted Targeting System. The first two Fallout games had turn-based combat, and so when they introduced first-person combat in Fallout 3 as a compromise, they also added in the VAT system that allows you to switch to sort of a turn-based system where you can target different parts of the body and decide what you want to shoot. It's just a more like tactical way to, to play instead of playing the game in real time. So I think for me, VATS is sort of a relic of role-playing games of the past, basically like attack, uh, spell, blah, blah, blah. It's, just, it's basically like pointing and clicking and choosing and letting that it fight. That makes me think of uh, Eternal Darkness, which had the same kind of limb targeting. Mm-hmm. And so I use it, to, like if somebody's coming up with a gun, I'll always shoot their hand. Yeah. And then they can't things slow down and they Mm -hmm. can't shoot me and then even if I can't take them out in one turn I do that but no that's what it reminds me of is Eternal Darkness Mm because it's really heavily based on limb targeting Mm -hmm. sure Fallout 4 was built in the same engine as Skyrim and feels way closer to Skyrim than I expected it Mm -hmm. to and I mean I play in first person because I I was a big first person shooter guy for a while and and that feels the most comfortable my uh, perception is really low right now and so I'm more accurate in first person mode with my guns than my VAT system is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I alternate. I like third person when I'm kind of out, you know, wandering around, exploring. I like to see my character kind of interacting with the environment. And even shooting, I do a, a, a decent amount of it in third person at this point. But I jump in the first when I'm in a tight area and I'm trying to parse through the details to find items that I can collect as opposed to like debris. And the, the camera is also, I think, easier to manage when you're in an enclosed area. And when I need to really line up the sights in a battle, that's kind of kicking my ass. Yeah, when I uh, do stealth sniping in Skyrim, I will switch into first person. But otherwise, like playing with outfits and clothing is a really big part of games for me. And if you're playing in first person, you can't see the pretty outfits you just dressed your character in. I think you would love Fallout 4 then. As a first time Fallout player, I definitely think there's a lot about this game to like. The crazy post-apocalyptic like Americana world is is cool and... There's a lot to see and do and get distracted by, and yeah, it's it's good. Josh had never played any other Fallout, but Mandy, you, you've you played them. I played Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. So what do you think it's gone from 3 to 4? Do you like where it's headed, where it's at? Yes and no. I, I don't like how story-heavy it is. Mm-hmm. It bothers me because I feel like the appeal of Fallout is just you make up your character and you do whatever you want to do with them and you make them the type of person and figure out how you want to play the game. And I mean, you can still do that, but I feel like it batters you over the head mm-hmm. with the story. Mm-hmm. And that kind of annoys me because I don't want to <laughs> progress the story. I just want to do the stuff that's fun for me and mess around in this cool world. Yeah. But I mean, the characters are great. There's all the weird 1940s, 1950s detective stuff. Uh, my current companion is a robot hard-boiled detective <laughs> who asked me to be his partner and gave me a, a trench coat, <laughs> a trench coat and a battered fedora, and we go around and solve mysteries together. So I mean, it's it's wonderful. Yeah. I found a radio station that has a shadow style radio play, and like it even has like the corny messages to kids like they'd have on something like The Shadow or Little Orphan Avenue. Like, you have to help the... I can't remember his name, but you have to help the such and such guy. Like... Mm -hmm. I haven't played with the base building as much as I thought it would because I got so focused on the hardware detective stuff, but that's really cool and yeah. fun. The base building is what really sucked me into the game because mm-hmm. uh, it was really difficult to figure out how it worked at first. And, you know, I was playing it on launch day and was trying to figure it out and there wasn't a lot of good resources out yet. But I eventually, like, figured it out. And once it clicked, it was like, oh, my gosh, like... I can do this, this, and this, Mm -hmm. and just spent hours and hours and hours building Sanctuary, which is the first real, like, civilization you get to start building. Mm -hmm. And 
getting to clean up the litter or getting to like destroy dilapidated buildings and then rebuild them and stuff. It's just like, it's so much fun and it's so detailed. Yeah. I came across a raider settlement. I had a pretty hard one battle against uh, three or four raiders. One had a power suit armor on and um, he had a a, a mini nuke launcher as well. So it was like (laughs) some guy randomly walking by with his dog got embroiled in the fight. (laughs) So he was fighting them and they were fighting him and I'm just like trying to back pedal and and get my uh, equipment in order and i'm just hearing massive explosions and <laughs> i finally go over there and the guy with the mini nuke he's out of bullets so he's just charging at me and he doesn't have any other gun <laughs> so he's trying to get close enough to me to punch me <laughs> and i'm just pelting him with bullets and i run away and then i get pelted with bullets and collect his gear start making my way back up to the uh, settlement lo and behold the guy with the dog is still alive walking on his merry way he must have handled the other two guys no problem and survived two or three direct blasts from a mini nuke <laughs> well, maybe, he had maybe a dog. he's a mysterious stranger in maybe. his civilian identity the, the mysterious stranger has been helping me out I took the mysterious stranger perk which means a guy in a trench coat and fedora will randomly show up <laughs> and kill stuff for you sometimes I'm seeing a pattern here <laughs> <laughs> I, I like trench coats and fedoras only together not separately mm. but uh i got jumped by a legendary monster and i went into vats to attack it and he just shows up one shot kills it and it drops <laughs> like this gun that's it's a, it's a laser rifle and it has like it poisons monsters it has poison bullets so i'm going to move the mod that poisons the bullets onto a better gun probably mm. but yeah got a sweet drop and i didn't have to do anything just my other bff the mysterious stranger who is also apparently julian's bff <laughs> yeah show, showed up and took care of it all yeah for me. and i you know he didn't want to stop and chat so i thought oh, okay you can go on your merry way he doesn't want to blow his cover julian which actually right. speaking of um that was one of my favorite little tidbits from new vegas is where when you find that guitar player on the side of the road and he's searching for his father who he's always heard was some sort of a mysterious fellow and if you somehow uh, if your um, ability to convince him is high enough you can eventually find work for him at a casino but he'll give you the gun the revolver that the mysterious stranger uses <laughs> so every time you unholster it it plays that guitar note oh it's so good <laughs> and then when you put it back it's a bring like the end That's of the fight sweet. sort of sound it was the coolest thing in that entire game that, that does sound pretty cool by the way the mysterious stranger is a reference to a Mark Twain story I just had to throw my my lit degree around. Cool. One one thing that does interest me about Fallout uh, Four is that apparently they let you be Polly in Fallout Four, which is great, and I hope they don't, you know patch it out later or something oh, uh, they don't patch out bugs i mean <laughs> right oh right this is bethesda they don't patch out bugs they, they actually release patches that add more well, bugs bu- right is... the backward flying dragon yeah, right that was, that was a good one it's a goodie i don't want any relationships in fallout 4 i just mm-hmm. want to be best friends with nick valentine which my dog and yeah i don't want to date anybody uh, which which is great like i'm i my love the fact that killed, they i love the fact that they leave that open and you can you know decide for yourself how you want to play it mm-hmm. the the, the whole relationship dating sim thing is something that's like I really like and is important to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't see a lot of games. I can't actually think of any where you can actually be polyamorous in the games. Sims. The Sims. The, the Sims. Okay. So the Sims. Uh, I, my whole thing with the Sims was like, how many people can I be in a re- relationship at once? <laughs> that's kind of great. If you're in like a dozen relationships at once, like your Sim is always happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I believe that, which is the opposite of how it happens in real life. Because mm. the problem with having three girlfriends is that you have three girlfriends. <laughs> Yeah, I recently oh, met God. Piper in yeah. Fallout 4, <laughs> and it, I'm keeping her as a companion because I think she's the easiest one to max out mm-hmm. the friendship with, and I, I want to get that trophy. But, like, everything I do, she likes. Like, I'll walk, you know, I'll, like, be walking around, and I'll pick a lock, and it's like, Piper liked that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's it's so weird. And there, I even did a thing, and I don't remember what it was, but it was like, Piper loved that. <laughs> And, like, with any of the other companions I've had, it's, like, your companion hated this thing you just mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, I would give uh, drugs to the um, the drugged out lady in Sanctuary. I can't remember her name. Oh, the old woman. Yeah. yeah. Is it Mama Murphy? Mama Murphy. Mama I knew it was uh, something with M.M. and mom stuff. <laughs> 
No, but so I gave her drugs, and mm-hmm. whoever my companion was, I think it was uh, the Cogsworth? butler. Yeah, it was yeah, Cogsworth. Yeah, he hates drugs. And he's oh, he like, could become your companion? Yeah. I haven't even. Like, when when Cogsworth was my companion, everything I did, he hated. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I don't keep a companion. See, that's, that's – the not wanting to keep a companion at all just confuses me. That's so the opposite of the way I play anything. That's how it was in 3. You know, you're by yourself, and I didn't like the dog. I mean – the only thing the dog for me was good for in part three was uh, the random occurrence when the uh, alien spaceship would fall and that uh, alien blaster that could catch, catch things on fire. It was the way the, the graphics were in that game. I mean, it was next to impossible to spot an item lying on the ground out in the middle of nowhere. So I would have the dog meet me. And then I'd say, find me something. And he would sniff around and find me that gun. I can't remember what it was called, the Fire Lance or something. Part of the mods that I use for Skyrim specifically make followers and companions more useful Mm -hmm. or, you know, add new quest-aware companions. Like, I love companions as an extension of really enjoying the whole relationship stuff. It's just they don't do anything. They are with you, and then they run into battle. Great. And then you've got a, then you've got a burn a stim pack. Like there was a sniper in New Vegas. Now, it would be cool if I could approach a camp and say, hey, you sit here and watch me, like, whisk, what, uh, quiet, and kind of oh, yeah. cover my back, sniping dudes out, you know, as opposed to just running into battle, getting killed, uh, or knocked unconscious or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's nice, it's nice to have a pack mule with you, but... I'll just, you know. Yeah, some of, some of the companion mods I have for Skyrim do give them more, like, or commands you can give them and make that a possibility. So, mm-hmm. like, I totally get just having another NPC AI that is stupid, mm-hmm. you know, screwing up your stealth or whatever. Yeah, that would be annoying. Mm-hmm. I, and, you know, I love so many of those old Clint Eastwood westerns where it was just this guy come rolling into town. You know, he's chopping on a fucking stogie and uh, plays <laughs> shit to waste. And then he's off, you know. I mean, uh, I don't need some piper you know, tagging <laughs> I, along with me. <laughs> I was doing a quest and they told me. I had to make Piper wait outside because they didn't want her around. So I went and made her stand in a corner. Yeah. And then while I was doing my quest, I was still getting Piper liked that. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in the corner. She, she still liked Just it. Out in the rain, you know. I, I'm beginning to think Piper has a fetish. <laughs> Which is another thing that's kind of different. Uh, a weather system. I mean, it was raining. It was a, it was like a, a good storm brewing when I was playing it, and then afterwards it was really foggy. Yeah, there's there's like these uh, like nuclear storm, like mm-hmm. acid rain storms that, yeah. that show up, and it kind of sucks because like whenever you're out unsheltered, you're getting radiation damage, mm-hmm. and so like whenever that happens, I find the nearest bed and just sleep through it. Sleep through it. <laughs> no, Julian's got the 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 perk where he's not really human, and radiation heals him, right? Uh, no, I, I have one where uh, water doesn't give me radiation oh, okay. damage and I can breathe underneath, but I haven't so, come across that one yet. So question. That's a good one. Um, that sounds like a good one. Since Julian has played previous Fallout games and, you know, Mandy's played Fallout 3, um, how much was like weather stuff and having to deal with weather problems a part of the previous Fallout games? They weren't. Yeah. So it's interesting to me hearing you guys talk about Fallout 4 and hearing a bunch of stuff that they've added that sounds exactly like features of very popular Skyrim mods. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm like, sure they, yeah. Well, right. Like, I'm wondering, because, you know, Bethesda has always been very open and honest about how prominent the modding community is for their games. But, like, so there's a fall- Skyrim mod called Frostfall uh, that specifically adds in, uh, you have to pay attention to the weather. If it's snowing, you know, you can die of exposure you have to put up a tent to protect yourself etc cetera, etc cetera. one of the most popular mods out there very well known and you know here the next bethesda game has all this weather stuff mm-hmm. the one thing i think it's missing that i really liked from new vegas was the um hardcore mode where you'd have to monitor food sleep irradiation and water so you'd always have to have a source of all of those with you and they would affect you in negative ways if your food meter got too high. No, and it would work really well with the setup for the game, too. It would, because now you can it'd actually make food. It would work better than ever. Pro- probably there will be a mod for that. I'm sure, but there's a mod for that nice for Skyrim. That, um, it seemed like such a... I think that was the preferred way that most people played New Vegas. It's been a lot of blowback that it hasn't been offered in 4. And or they'll add it in an expansion. It would have been nice that. to have had out the, out the gate. Question, are you a man or a woman? I'm a, I, I play as the man. Mandy mm. plays as the woman. Mm. Default, or did you try to make yourself? I'm not big on character creations. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just not. Mm-hmm. Like, I I really 
don't care what my character looks like as as long as they're not just completely ridiculous looking. And so all I did was gave my character a beard and sent him out the door. <laughs> Mandy? Oh, no, I, I spent some time on care. Well, I just yeah. tried to make my character look like she would be in a Raymond Chandler novel. <laughs> and once I pulled that off, I was yeah. done. I didn't design my husband in the game because I didn't care. Oh, you it, could do that? Yeah. yeah you uh, can. Oh, I suppose you could. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Like, I play in first person all the time, mm-hmm. so I, I don't ever see my character. I hear the race of your baby is random also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are some people who have children that uh, leads to questions. And- <laughs> yeah. See, I, I love character creation so much. The, the combination of character creation mods that I have for Skyrim gives me, I am not kidding, literally over 1,000 different hairstyles. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just hairstyles mm-hmm. before we get into like eye colors, et cetera, et cetera. So like I the idea of more expansive character creation is also always a draw to me. I wonder if anybody's made a character that looks like Geralt. I mean, they probably have. You, could, you got I've scars. seen some good ones. Yeah. How how expansive is the character creation in Fallout 4? Because in Fallout 3, it wasn't that impressive. Well, more in yeah, New Vegas. It's a much improved over Fallout 3, I would say. I, I've enjoyed it more than other recent character creators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it isn't just like, here's your nose, and then you run a... It's, it's basically like a slider, but without a slide. Or you just grab it and kind of... It's like The Sims 4, kind of, actually, Mm -hmm. is what it reminds me of. Speaking of Geralt, uh, you know, all these November games came out, and I still haven't finished the Hearts of Stone expansion, which came out in October. Mm -hmm. What I did play, though, was super good. The Witcher 3 gets kind of monotonous and tedious toward the end. And I mean, I love The Witcher 3, but it gets... uh... (laughs) It gets... It becomes like a chore. Right. And I'm not even close to... To the end, I guess, but uh, where I'm at. Oh, but once you get to Kier Morham, it starts feeling like a chore for yeah. the rest of the game. But then Hearts of like I finished the game and then started Hearts of Stone, and Hearts of Stone just feels like bam, it pulls you right back in because mm-hmm. the writing for the story is so good and it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, all of the little plot details are just so much fun. The uh, enemies are way harder though, there's a noticeable yeah. jump in like. You know, all of a sudden you're having to spend a lot of time in combat because everything has so much health. Yeah, it's weird because you really didn't have to be a master of combat in the base game. Right. You, know, you could kind of take some hits and just roll out of the way most of the time. I, I very seldom parry unless I'm fighting straight up human, which is the only time it really seems to work. But um, seeing some of the things from uh, Hearts of Stone, I mean, it's like you should have been paying attention. We know we didn't force you to really learn this stuff, but you probably should have learned it. <laughs> Uh, Hearts of Stone also came with uh, physical Gwent cards. Yes. That is the one Witcher 3 thing I'm interested in because I like real gaming and I never get to talk about it these days. Well, then you're in luck, Johnny, because when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about Gwent, Hearts of Stone, and what it means to be a man named Geralt. Of course, uh, before we go, I'd like to uh, thank a couple people. Aaron Voltenson, thank you for uh, all the fine art that you uh, contribute to the uh, podcast that we do here. Um, you can see all that great stuff on uh, halfglassgaming.com, our uh, mother site, our mother three site. Um, you can also find us on uh, retrovolve.com, where you'll find a bevy, nay, a slew of gaming-related articles. Of course, we're on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. But uh, in addition to Aaron, I must, as always... I don't think I forgot you, fellas. Wheelie, 2XAA, thank you for the music. Keeps this podcast rolling on the highway to hell. Uh, so when we come back, we're going to get into some cards, some shards, and some hearts of stone. back from a very brief uh, break. Uh, I think between the four of us, we've probably amassed a good, what, 45 minutes of Gwent? At least a good 45 minutes. We've all played it. That's what you're going to write home about in your 50,000 word uh, Mensa novel, you know? (laughs) 
But I got to say, one thing that strikes me right out the gate is that it is just really not as engaging as it is in the game. A lot of the stuff that the game does is it it automatically does the things for you that are tedious. Yeah. Like drawing through your deck and pulling out the like muster cards and uh-huh. things like that. And like sorting things into rows and having a nice game board mm-hmm. and, you know, adding up your score. Like all that stuff that that makes the game drag and feel tedious. It's and just, shuffling. See, right, the, it's just streamlined, <laughs> like perfectly streamlined. See, the only thing that felt tedious to me was keeping track of the points because, like, I hate numbers. Mm-hmm. Everything else, like, I've played so many different CCGs that, like, it, you probably noticed when I was playing uh, against Julian here where I just automatically set down, like, the muster cards all together in a way that you could see all the points mm-hmm. because it's, it's just, like, second nature to me when you're playing this kind of game. Yeah, one tip that I kind of just dawned on me while I was sorting my cards was any of the uh, muster cards just remove them from the deck set them aside so you don't have to go through the whole thing and you know you just got to go through you know eight or nine cards but uh even the sto- the, the scorecard that it came with is difficult yeah I, I can't use it <laughs> I mean it's a piece of shit I, I do agree that they should have included a game board because mm-hmm. you know they're basing it off of this you know video game mm-hmm. game so you know make it make it look like the game yeah as much as you can. i would have plunked down i would have plunked down fifty dollars uh for a milton bradley style game board that folds in on itself and all four of the decks right out the gate uh one of the things that that mandy said would be cool is if it were like uh like a cloth board mm-hmm. and it had like a map on the other side oh that would be cool you yeah. say cool things, Mandy. I, I do. I try. <laughs> what did you think? You didn't really get into it. No, I, I didn't really like it. It's pretty much exactly the kind of things I don't like. Mm-hmm. I like really draw heavy card games where you always have the feeling like if I get this card, mm-hmm. then the tides are going to turn completely. Mm-hmm. Even, you can build a deck with maybe the potential to draw a few cards, but you're pretty much stuck with what you have at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So I hate that if you get a bad yeah. hand and then yeah, it's no you Pokemon. just feel like you have... To, well, you know, I, I used to get paid to play Pokemon cards. Really? I, I was a professional Pokemon gym leader. Gym leader? Toys R Us. I actually believe they still do this mm-hmm. on Saturdays. They have uh, a thing where kids can come play Pokemon cards with Pokemon gym leaders who are just Toys R Us employees who are they're paying oh. to play pokemon cards so they i would get free pokemon cards and uh i'd get little badges that i could give out to kids mm-hmm. they beat me and i would spend my saturday playing ca- pokemon cards against kids wow. which uh isn't ideal because they try to cheat a of lot course. of course but uh no i played so i played a ton of pokemon i like the potential for the tides to always turn mm-hmm. i like knowing there's good stuff in your deck and like having the feeling like maybe maybe this time and like mm-hmm. it makes it exciting and interesting for me i think gwent has this element to it listening to you describe pokemon it's about sort of maneuvering it's almost like a boxing match you know if you draw a shit deck even if you discard the two freebies and you get crap it's like sitting there thinking how am i gonna win with uh three you know biting frosts and (laughs) two decoys and uh you know the deck that i played with was a monster deck that uh josh put together that involved a lot of muster cards Mm -hmm. so like based on that uh it feels like deck planning is a large part of the game Mm -hmm. which like i i get what mandy's saying and and that's that's valid, but if you plan your deck ahead of time, you can figure out how to mitigate mm-hmm. a crappy draw at the beginning. Yeah. Just by either not having the kind of cards that would screw you over in that combination, mm-hmm. or by, you know, setting it up where you can go back and get specific cards you need. Mm-hmm. Like when I played, I used a, uh, a leader card that let me discard two cards in order to draw one. And, you know, that was a useful ability, and I could use that. Etc. Mm-hmm. Well, knowing that you were playing the monster deck when we went against one another, I chose the Skoytel, the squirrel deck. Just knowing what kind of a deck monster is, how it is front row heavy, I made a point of putting in a bunch of Biting Frosts and second and third tier to the extent that you can, third tier with Skoytel. But that kind of gave me a little bit of a strategic advantage. Right. Also picking a, a leader card that would scorch your uh, front row. Right. So I feel like Gwent is trying to be a more metagame heavy card game than Mm -hmm. a more, you know, how can I fix what's going on? It seems to not be a draw heavy game on purpose. Mm -hmm. 
I do notice that in the rules, they don't mention the option of giving somebody a card if they beat you. <laughs> well, that's when you play for keepsies. Yeah. <laughs> Josh kept talking about how it was like a complex version of war with mm-hmm. like strategy. And so I thought of the card game Yomi, mm-hmm. which is, um, it actually was going to be a Street Fighter card game, but then that wound up falling through. So it's just like a fictional fighting game, card game, and every deck is a character. And it's sort of a little rock, paper, scissors, and a little war. Mm-hmm. And uh, really relies heavily on uh, hand reading, like guessing what your opponent's hand is and what they're going to play. Hmm. Well, in Yomi, you draw a new card every time you play it. Right, and there are tons of cards that let you draw even more cards so you can get a really robust hand. Mm-hmm. Right, and so you're always drawing cards. Mm-hmm. Where did you end up buying Yomi? Because I remember you asking me where the <laughs> Yeah, that game... was a disaster. Yeah, we tried to buy Yomi, and so I started looking on Google, and I, I had typed in where to buy Yomi in Minneapolis, and Google auto-corrected it to where to buy heroin in Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where? Where, where is, can I yeah, buy some I'm heroin? Right. <laughs> no, and I, well, we thought maybe Barnes & Noble had it because we'd already gone to a bunch of game shops at this point, and mm-hmm. we found one deck at mm. like 10 at game and shops. Uh, no, j- oh. we went to uh, a game shop down the street. And it's they called had one Mead deck. Hall. Mead Hall, yeah. yeah. But then uh, oh, we, we tried a bunch of others and none of them had it. About 15th and LaSalle. Yeah. So I went to check Barnes & Noble to see if they had it since they do sell some card games and they showed me a book called I Don't Have Any Friends. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. It's like, you're trying to buy this game. Clearly yeah, you need this instead. <laughs> <laughs> and sign up to become a member and save $25. <laughs> but, uh, so, so we just got it online. Uh-huh. It's mm-hmm. a Japanese game, though. No, it's an American card game. Really? Uh, the guy, have you played Street Fighter Puzzle Fighter? The Tetris? The video game, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the guy who made that made that card game. Oh, okay. David so what's, the, what's Yomi? What is it? It's, it's just the name of the card game. For some reason it sounds Japanese to me. Yeah, I guess it does. Mm-hmm. It, it, I mean, it is a... Used as, that's why that book came up is because it was written by a Japanese woman mm. and her first name is Yomi. There you go. It all comes full circle. But uh, no, I guess it's set in the Fantasy Strike universe. It's just like a fictional fighting game mm-hmm. universe. It's super fun. It's really fast and it really does play a lot like... A fighting game is so much of it is understanding your character and then understanding your opponent's characters. It's a really neat feel, too, because anytime you get bored of it, you could just play a different character and it really kind of becomes a different game. Hmm. Uh, Hearts of Stone, they added uh, new cards? They added 10 new cards. Okay. I think four of them might, have, might be leader cards. They added the toad from the sewers. <laughs> yeah. There's like, like the first quest in Hearts of Stone or like one of the first quests is that you have to go into the city sewers and kill a frog. Mm -hmm. And that that frog is one of the cards. There's Mm. also a cow card. Yeah. But it's kind of cool that in the the Gwent decks that came with the game that the uh, additional cards from the expansion were in Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I kept noticing a couple of weird design choices. Uh, Like, for example, the the hero cards in, in the physical card game tend to have very high point value, and they're not affected by any special ability. So now we have a type of card that in small numbers are practically useless because you can't use special abilities to help deal with that. But if you stack your deck with a bunch of hero cards, now they're super powerful. Well, they I mean, they could have mitigated the whole thing just by adding a rule where you can only have a max of two hero cards in your deck. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, they could have done something, but they didn't do any of that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, if I if I keep playing Gwent, I might make that a house rule because hero cards totally throw the balance of the game off. Mm-hmm. And it was designed around the idea that this Gwent exists in this world that you're in in the game where not everyone has every hero card. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, you might find a guy who has like one or two hero cards, but you know that's really it, and that's yeah. that's kind of I think how the game was intended to be played. And so when they brought it over to the card game, obviously, like people who get the card game want to have every card mm-hmm. that's in the game. However, the downside of that is you end up with a completely overpowered mm-hmm. deck. Well, and I think it's nice to have a hero card that's worth like 10 <clears throat> points in, in the uh, first row, let's say. You're going against monster card. You draw a whole slew of the uh, muster cards. 
and I put that frost on there, reduces your value down. I can still maybe play that one hero card right. to give me a little bit of a, a fighting chance. Right. But if you're in a position where you're going against all those cards, I have two hero cards and a trumpeter card. Had it, the trumpet have affected the hero cards, perhaps I could have still won. But because it doesn't, you right. know, you're sort of in this position where you have this useless card. And- right. Josh built the deck I used, and uh, and I used the uh, leader that gave me the ability to discard two to draw one mm-hmm. of my choice. So, you know, I was thinking, oh, well, if worse comes to worse, I can just go in into the deck and get Geralt, and then I have 15 points. Okay. Uh, Absolutely not. You heard correct, folks. He just said Geralt. <laughs> and I will not stand for that. Says Mr. Pokemans. Hey, Pokemans, that's real, okay? <laughs> that's raw. That's what the street's about. You ask Barack Obama what he's playing, he's playing Pokemon, okay? <laughs> he I'm doesn't know about no true. Gerald. They but don't that's... just call him Jer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm coming from this from a position where my my favorite card game ever is, uh, you know, bullshit that I made up uh, one time at a convention where, you know, they have like a free gaming area at most conventions and the they have a chest full of card games. And after, you know, a couple of hours, there's just cards everywhere on the bottom of the chest. So what I did, uh, there were like three other people who just wanted to do something. I grabbed a bunch of handfuls of the random mix of card games and doled them out and said, all right, so here's what we're doing. If you can play a card and explain why that card helps you towards a win condition, it is a legal play. So, you know, like I had, I played a spy card from, you know, some superhero card game and said, all right, so this spy card, according to the text, lets me go into your deck and steal some of your cards. And the opponent was like, yes, but I play my four of diamonds and now that spy is paid off. It's mm-hmm. like the Calvin Ball of card games. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's what uh, some other people have referred to it as. Or the mat shot of... Or the mat shot of card, card games. games. Yeah. But I will say, um, for Gwent, it's kind of a weird thing, owning them now. I think the art on the cards look fantastic, but I kind of feel like it would have been easier to have just released the app that everybody's crying for. Pull it up on your phone. You could play somebody you know, in the same room, on the other side of the, the room. You know, I mean, there's a wide... Golf there, where you right? Can play against in the somebody. same room or on the other side of the room. <laughs> exactly, right. So, and have but, you like have to earn the cards too? That too, but you know, I think the it's a what does it say? It's the uh, collector's edition of this set. I don't think they're at a high enough quality where it's something that I would even just display, even if I didn't use it. I don't know. There's just something about it that it's great. I like playing it. I can see probably playing it maybe once or twice before I never play it again. But uh, but I got Fallout Four going on right now. Oh, Geralt. Do you, do you have a man crush on Geralt? I don't. I just wish I knew him. Just be like, yeah. Oh, Geralt? Oh, I know Geralt. You'd be a cool guy that. to, you know, sit in a pub and be like, you know, tell mm-hmm. me some stories, man. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, ah, this one time I fought a three-toed boar tree hump man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one time I, I helped a kid get his voice back. <laughs> and? Well, I was in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing that I found interesting uh, uh, is that this this is not the first physical non-video game Witcher thing that has come out. Uh, I had vaguely known about the books because mm-hmm. I think that had been mentioned sometime in the past. Yep. Uh, but apparently there was a tabletop RPG with three uh, different like source books or spot books uh, that were based on the Witcher book. Hmm. That is interesting. What's funny is that apparently in the books, which I haven't read, but uh, apparently in the books, there is a game called Gwent. Well, Gwent is just what it's called in Polish. Well, it's okay. It's the same. It's the same game. It's called Gwent in the books, but it, the rules are too complex for Geralt, and mm-hmm. he can't play it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, only dwarves can play it, so it's just a dwarven card game, and like. They talk about how the Witcher, because in all the Witcher stories, they always call Geralt just the Witcher. Or the Butcher of Blaviken. <laughs> and they talk about how he likes to sit and watch the dwarves play, but the rules are too complicated for him to grasp. Yeah. He doesn't seem like a guy who would pick up on Gwent too quickly. Mm-hmm. I think it's an interesting mechanic for the game 
this idea that a good number of people that you come across, and specifically at least one time that sticks out in my mind during an actual mission, people are just like, hey, let's play some Gwent. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> Well, there's, you know, been other games in the past that did that. Yeah. The most, I believe the most famous would be like Final Fantasy VIII was Triple Triad. Uh, and then Final Fantasy IX had the card game as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a card game in New Vegas also, or some sort of a game. But I, uh, I, it was just explained in such a convoluted way. Yeah, I, like, I, tr I tried playing the card game in like, New Vegas. Yeah, you and, don't want to take the time because it seems so cumbersome. Right, not only was it complex and cumbersome, but at some point, like, I stopped being able to draw cards and mm. I couldn't figure out why. Mm. Bethesda. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's certainly no Gwent, and it's certainly no Witcher 3. Nay. Look, we all love the game. Well, I love the game. Josh loves the game. Mandy's watched it, and Reverend is aware of it. We've all played Gwent. I hear that there's a, a movie actually slated for yeah, development uh, and release in 2016. Yeah, it's a, a Polish director. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually has never made a full-length movie. He's only made short films. But uh, no, he's doing a... It's going to be an English language, which mm -hmm. your movie. Mm -hmm. It's not based on the game, though. It's based on the um, short stories. Is that the correct? The short stories and books. Books, the yeah. huge Witcher fictional universe. Mm -hmm. How popular is this book series? I mean, in Poland, it's massively popular. Yeah. Well, I, it's I think Lord Poland, of the Rings. Because, like, well, and that's my question. Is it? Like, how? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, like, the author of the books is has been described as that. In the fact, because the books have been around since the early 90s. Okay. Or it's actually been around since the late 80s, not the early 90s. Okay. It's just the early 90s was when it started to become really big. Mm -hmm. The video games are based on the book series. Yeah. And yeah, the video games based on the books. The new movie coming out is based on the books and the short stories. There was a TV show though in Poland. Uh, also. Yeah, there was. It was called The Hexer. Oh, so he wasn't a witcher? It, I think it was probably... Loosely based? Or? Well, I actually, I think it was called... I don't know how to say anything in Polish. It was called mm -hmm. Weetsman, which is probably what translates to The Witcher. Mm -hmm. But for when it was released outside, it was released as The Hexer. And they made a movie, too. I mean, it did not look very good. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the actor who played Geralt has flat out said that it was garbage. <laughs> the, his exact words were when they asked him what he thought of the Witcher stuff that he had done. He said, I can only answer with a single word, an obscene, albeit a short one. Yeah. <laughs> an obscene, albeit short one. Hmm. I just like to look up characters' histories mm -hmm. in the Witcher stories and books when they pop up. Like, Yennefer is a hunchback. In the books. Yeah. Well, the thing is that Yennefer is a hunchback who's super good well all sorceresses in the witcher universe use glamour magic and that's why they're all beautiful uh, women is because but Yennefer is the most beautiful woman in the world but it's just because she's the best at glamour magic and there's a story called the last witch hmm. where uh Geralt sees what she really looks like and she's like a hideous hunchback hmm. but he decides he loves her anyways and then they bang oh, i was gonna say did he see her uh post coitus and then he thought, wow. <laughs> like, so. I, Listen, I, I gotta get going. Uh, I, what is that? Vesemir? All right, I gotta get going. <laughs> Actually, hearing that makes me really happy. I I would love to see some shit like that in the games, just because mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so here's somebody who had been disguising their appearance because they're really ugly, and the person who loves them goes, "No, your appearance is not the important part." Yeah. And I I even understand why you were hiding it, but yeah. I I don't care. I love yeah. you. He's like, that's, look at me. I got this huge scar on my face, and <laughs> that's that's fantastic. I. That's too bad. That didn't make it into the games. Yeah. I mean, it might. Yennefer wasn't even in the games until The Witcher 3. Okay, mm -hmm. fair She enough. was mentioned. She just wasn't right. in them. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, oh, I... she wasn't in any of the other ones? No, because the other two games take place during the time where Girl is separated from Yennefer. So they're not oh. reunited until The Witcher 3. Because uh, they make some reference to their history together. Yeah. But, and uh, I just assume that was For fans good. of the books, like The Witcher 3 was a huge deal because mm -hmm. finally Yennefer would be in the games. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's such a robust universe. They have so many 
years and years of stories and novels that mm-hmm. they're really never going to run out of any material for games. The upcoming movie, there's a possibility that that'll become a series of films or television offshoots. I, I mean, I'm sure they'd love to make it a franchise. But it's going to be a Polish production that will be released internationally? It's a, a Polish director, but it's going to be shot English language with English speaking actors, mm-hmm. I think. You know, the Hobbit movies are over with, and they're mm-hmm. like, well, this could be another tent pole, and like, mm-hmm. it's getting more buzz because of this. So, this is the perfect time to buy up this property. We yeah. have more than 20 years worth of stories yeah. to mine from. We could keep this going forever. I mean, I think it would be better as a TV show than a movie. Yeah. Because The Witcher has mm-hmm. a really good format for a mm-hmm. monster of the week with an ongoing storyline arc, yeah. which is really a that type of TV show I cool. enjoy. I guess the movie is going to be based on two short stories that were in the same book as The Last Wish, Mm -hmm. which is the only Witcher story that I read. Mm. Now, the games themselves, especially like the expansion, I mean, are those all based on source material or is it just... I'm sure there's plenty of stuff in the games that isn't in the books, but I know a lot of the story in The Witcher, both minor quests and major story arcs are lifted directly from the source material. Like the whole storyline with Geralt losing his memory and spending... All That Time with Triss is a plot of one of the books. And the storyline with Geralt and Yennefer making the wish with the djinn and then going back to undo it to see if they're really in love is another Witcher book storyline. I want want to know which Witcher book it is where Geralt uh, has sex with someone on the back of a unicorn because I want to read that one Mm -hmm. and see what the original context was. That was actually... um an offshoot. It was a a, a penthouse uh, forum. Um, it's still canon. Dear penthouse, I never <laughs> thought it would happen to me. <laughs> I was on a unicorn. I was on a unicorn one night. <laughs> Yep. Now I actually want to write a penthouse letter style short story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, unicorn the unicorn somehow. thing is apparently from the books. Oh. Uh, she had a magnificent stuffed unicorn upon whose back she liked to make love. Geralt was of the opinion that the only place even less suited for lovemaking would be the back of a live unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> I love that thing you just said. Yeah, so it is from the books. It yeah. seemed like a very video gamey thing, but that's mm-hmm. probably great. Because in Poland, these books are so popular. Yeah. So that's probably great for people who are familiar from the books to actually see something like that pop up. Because I imagine that is a very beloved reference. I- oh, yeah. I'm sure there are plenty of women in, in Poland that have Ooh. stuffed unicorns in their boudoir uh, specifically for that reason. Man, I live in the wrong country. <laughs> <laughs> Geralt recalled pleasant moments spent with the sorcerers on the slope of a roof in the hollow of a dead tree on the balcony and those of others the railing of a bridge, a canoe, riding in steadily on a rushing stream and lastly while levitating 30 fathoms above the ground but worst of all was the unicorn. <laughs> One happy day, however, the thing collapsed beneath them. It ripped open and broke into pieces, causing the to burst into wild laughter. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. That is fantastic. Well, so, heck, we've uh, dealt with uh, Gwent um, (laughs) in a very professional manner. And uh, I don't know. It was fun playing it. Um, It's not something that I, you know, would spend probably any more time doing. Uh, I may, you know, once the other decks come out or I find somebody on the street who randomly approaches me and asks me if I want to play a game of Gwent, I'll just look at them with a silent stare and know that that is time for me to whip out my deck and deal the damage, (laughs) you know, take it easy.